are all more than welcome to this Open Table Network Q&A webinar. My name's Kieran Bowen and I have the privilege of being the coordinator of the Open Table Network. And I also have the privilege of sharing that the Open Table Network is now a charity after 10 months of waiting um, and several years of planning. And so we've asked several notable Christians who identify as LGBTQIA+, or as allies, to become our patrons. And being a patron means that they're an advocates for our network. They speak about us and support us in the public eye. And we're proud that they believe in what we're doing and want to have their names associated with us. So tonight, this is our seventh Q&A webinar with our new patrons. And we're going to be in conversation with Barbara Glasson. So good evening, Barbara, and thank you for joining us. And um, so um, for the benefit of those who haven't met Barbara, um, as you may not know that Barbara and I have known each other for probably about 15 years. And Barbara is a pastoral theologian who has worked among people of many different faiths and experiences. In 2000, she founded Somewhere Else, an inclusive faith community in Liverpool, where people gather to break where people gather to bake bread, that's quite hard to say, where people gather to bake bread and worship God. There she met LGBT plus Christians and other groups she calls prophetic communities. Her book, The Exuberant Church, Listening to the Prophetic People of God, reflects on coming out as a spiritual experience and how the church too must come out. Now Barbara sees the coming out process as both profoundly human and deeply of God. Then 10 years later, 2010, Barbara became the leader of Touchdown in Bradford, which is a listening community enabling safe spaces for dialogue with diverse communities, including people of diverse different faiths. And in 2018, she received the Archbishop of Canterbury's award for her work in peace and reconciliation. Uh, coming closer to the present in 2019, she became the president of the Methodist Church, um, Methodist Conference in Britain, and the Methodist Church approved a report um, in 2019 called God in Love Unites Us, which proposed to allow churches to hold same-sex weddings. But COVID restrictions delayed local churches debating and voting on this report, so she was unable to see a final vote before she stepped down in July 2020 from that one-year appointment. So um, since last year, Barbara has been teaching pastoral theology at the Queen's Foundation for Ecumenical Theological Education in Birmingham. So, if I can catch my breath, thank you very much for joining us, Barbara. It's lovely to uh, reconnect with you um, and to introduce you to people who haven't had the pleasure before. Um, thank you very much for your time this evening. How are you? Well, let's, get, let's begin at the beginning because it's a very good place to start. Um, you've written about how you grew up in Kent and you've described how that church was like a loving, safe, extended family, which also challenged you to ask big questions. So I'm curious about what kind of big questions you might have been asking or tempted to ask and what did you learn from that experience? Yeah, thanks, Karen. First of all, to say it's just lovely to see you and I wish I could see everybody's faces on the screen, but uh, welcome to everybody. And it's really a great privilege to be here with you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, and I do feel this is a bit like um, uh, any questions or uh, Desert Island Discs or something when I've got to review my whole life. Um, but, you know, it's not a, not a bad thing to do. And to sort of go back to the beginning. Um, yeah, I grew up in Kent. I grew up in a very safe, secure family environment. Um, Kent, as you know, people that grew up in Kent think of London as being the north. Um, we, grow, we grew up with sea on three sides of us and nearer to France than to London. Um, so in a way, it's a kind of a little bit of an island. I mean, it's very different now um, because it's commuter country because of the fast trains. But in those days, it was very rural. And um, I grew up in a fairly small village. Um, and my parents, uh, my mum particularly, was a, a staunch Methodist. You might say a staunch Methodist. Uh, my dad was an Anglican and more questioning in some ways about his faith, but mum had mum was if you'd cut mum in half sideways, you'd just see Methodist written through like a like a stick of rock, really. And um, so I suppose that safety and security gave me the chance to ask 
questions and to be annoying to my parents, as uh, as I hope uh, most people are. And um, and I was lucky in the sense that I had good uh, ministers that were around me that in, that 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 gave me space to uh, inquire and to ask and to challenge and to disagree in a in a way that I knew I was loved anyway. So that. Looking back, I mean, I think that's a huge, huge gift that people gave to me and give, gave to many others as well, I think. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that. So we found it's really, people have really uh, valued hearing the faith journey of, of, of the people that we've uh, kind of called on to advocate for us. Um, it's been really inspiring and, and sparked some fascinating conversations in, in the in the the webinar chat and afterwards too. So um, you have shared previously that you felt called to leadership in the church when you were 16, but at that time in Methodism, women couldn't be ordained. And so how did you experience that call? And how was it to know that maybe it wouldn't be fulfilled in that way at that time? Uh, that's an interesting question, Karen, isn't it? Because when you when you sense something as a calling and yet it's impossible, um, it, it, that's, that's quite, it's quite tricky to think myself back into that because I think I just thought, oh no, it, that's impossible, that's just silly. <laughs> um, and obviously, uh, you know, the Church of England weren't having conversations about women's ministry at that point. Mm. Uh, Methodism, uh, I mean, we've always had women's leadership and women local preachers, but there was no sense that you could be ordained. So it was kind of, it was an impossible question. It, I, I, it's hard to describe and think back into that now. So I, I wasn't resentful. Um, I, 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 wasn't, um, I wasn't thwarted in that sense. It was just that's not something you can't do, you know. And um, I suppose I, I, um, I put that calling to one side and thought, well, I think, I think uh, there's always a way round things. And uh, I think God often takes us the way round things. So if we can't go straight on, then we take another route. And um, looking back, I can see that that other route actually was a much better route for me because I wasn't ready to be a, a minister at 60. You know, I needed to live and I needed to have life experience and I needed to, um, uh, yeah, learn and, and grow up and all that sort of stuff. So so in that sense, um, the other route wasn't a tragedy. It was just it was just another way around. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I think um, our, our uh, kind of community have found these kind of conversations about sense of vocation valuable because we know that there are members who've had a sense of call that may, may, maybe isn't fully open to them because of gender identity or sexual orientation. So there are some parallels which people have found fruitful to explore. And I should say, I mean, I, sh I should say that I'm thankful to the pioneers, you know, across the denominations that actually pushed at that door. I, I wasn't a pioneer uh, in that, you know, that time in that place, but there were pioneers and there were people that actually saw this as a matter of injustice and were prepared to put themselves there and, and, and push hard at that door. And I, I guess that's a resonance with you and your community as well. Mm. There were those, you know, and I think in the Church of England as well with women ministers, there were those that went first and fought the cause. Mm. And then once the door was open ajar, the others were able to come through. And I think I was very much one of the second wave, really. Mm. Uh, and I benefited from the pioneers and from the people that really fought for something that they thought was impossible, but, but knew it was a matter of justice and, and went for it anyway. Uh, yeah. So you've talked about kind of, um, you know, as a, as a young woman uh, seeking alternative life experience, um, maybe while you were considering leadership in the church. So you studied agri agricultural sciences with a view to working for the church overseas. Um, so that's, uh, it's not an obvious correlation between church leadership and agricultural science. So um, how did your studies influence your later ministry? Well, I just loved biology at school. It was my favorite subject. It was something that I could do. And uh, I and because I'd grown up in the countryside, because because I love the natural world, because I, you know, was very um, au fait with farming and all that stuff. Um, it seemed to me that it was um, a way of using that love for biology in a way that was possible in a practical way. 
<clears throat> so it, it looks like a bit of a, a wiggly uh, root, but but that's how it came to be. And um, I was I didn't wasn't great at school. I did I, I mean I I went to the grammar school, but I I kept my head below the parapet. Um, I wasn't a high achiever, um, and this seemed to be a way of of um, of of engaging with something that I was interested in and that I was uh, reasonably good at. Uh, but also had some practical implications. So that's how the agriculture came to be. So I went off farming because you had to do a year farming before you could go to agricultural college. So I went farming. So I was um, I was six months um, down on the in Hampshire um, on a dairy farm. And then I was um, six months back in Kent being a shepherd to some sheep. Um, so there's an obvious link there with um, with the pastoral ministry. Yes. Um, but I think the, the overarching thing, Kieran, is that I've always understood my faith in, in terms of organic language. Mm. Um, and I, it took me a while to kind of register this. But when, if you think about the bread church, you know, there's yeast and there's flour and, you know, there's all those sort of natural ingredients and things grow and we talk about, you know, the church flourishing and, and all those sort of process organic words, I think, came from my, come from my understanding of the living world. Mm. And I think it's really helpful to think of, of um, communities and, and our lives and churches, you know, in, in that sense of organic language rather than structural language. I think structural language often deadens us. Mm. Um, I think every time the church restructures, it probably makes itself worse. Whereas if we think in terms of, you know, small things like yeast and, and small things like seeds, mm. you know, we can see that that organic way of being is actually how, how, we, um, how we find life. How, mm. And it links very closely to the environment. But that's how we find life. And, um, and so I think if I look back on my ministry, I think that time in agricultural science was absolutely key. Mm. Um, but, but if you think thought about you know a kind of career path it was nonsense because you know I, I, I trained on a farm and I ended up in city centres so it looks a bit it looks very disjointed but I can, I can see the logic to it. <laughs> There's some really powerful uh, imagery um, that resonates with biblical texts of course doesn't it? and one of the biblical texts we've used in um, sharing the story of the Open Table Network is the, is the parable of the mustard seed you know, from some something, you know, so kind of abundant grows from such a small seed. Um, mm. So I, yeah, so I, I really relate to that. Um, so, so when, so you eventually did train as a local preacher and then did an MA in theology and a training course at an ecumenical college. So um, how did that training in an ecumenical environment inform your ministry? Um, because obviously Open Table's been an ecumenical movement all this time, so I'm wondering if there might be some insights that we might learn from, from that. So how did training in an ecumenical college inform your ministry? Well, it wasn't, ex it wasn't an ecumenical college, it was an ecumenical course, and it was part-time. Um, I had three young children at home at that time. Um, my husband's uh, also a Methodist minister, so you can imagine that our home environment was quite lively and full on. And um, I, I trained one, week, one evening a week, one weekend a month, and then I did a summer school. So there was a pattern to that over three years. And so I, I always had to contextualise what I was learning because, you know, you can, mum can go off to college, you know, to learn a course. But you come home on a Sunday night and the kids don't give a fizz, really. They just want their tea and, you know, <laughs> tell you what they've been up to. So um, so there was always the contextualising. And on the course that I was on, um, it was Anglican, Methodist, Roman Catholic, actually, as well, and some uh, Baptist and URC. So there was a, a, a wide range of both people training for ordination and people that were training for lay ministries. And that was a very rich source of um, companionship. We learned to know each other and to, you know, rub along together. And, um, and also, I think it's important when you disagree and when you come from a different perspective to be able to put that out there with people that you know, you know, will respect you and your opinions and rub the edges off you as well and tell you when you're wrong. So um, I, I have valued that. 
I think I am firmly Methodist, <laughs> whatever that means. Um, I, I, I self-identify as Methodist. Um, and that, in a sense, gives the scope for being open to many, many others. Um, so there was a certain, there is a certain security I feel in my own identity, which which enabled that sort of discourse to happen, um, which was was creative and sometimes very annoying and sometimes very confusing as theological education is. Um, but I valued it, and and I think because it was over three years, it gave me gave me time. Um, to integrate what I was learning into who I was becoming, which which felt important. Absolutely. And so well, five years after ordination, you became the minister in Liverpool City Centre. Um, and a few years after that, that's where we met at um, the Liverpool City Centre Methodist Church was known unconventionally as somewhere else. And it's over a bookshop called News From Nowhere. Um, so it's not your typical church building or your church community, is it? Um, so I was a member of the LGBT plus Christian group that met there and you've written about how that group and others that you've worked with during that time and since um, taught you so much about what it means to be a prophetic community. So what does a prophetic community look like for you? Oh, that's a big question. Um, I mean, to just to rewind slightly, I was a year wandering around Liverpool city centre before anything resembling a church occurred. And I think in that wandering about and talking with people and, and meeting odd bods that were around the city centre as well, I think I experienced a kind of reversal of power, if you like. I mean, I think I, I initially thought, oh, I'm, I'm the minister, you know, I'm going to be in this, I'm, I'm the city centre minister. And then I realised that um, there were so many people in the city centre who had such wisdom and um, insight and who were streetwise in ways that I was a, and knew the place and, um, uh, uh, and so began to teach me um, what, what it meant to be you know, and I come from Kent, I'm not a scouser, so, you know, I, I was the outsider, I don't even speak the right way. So that sense that um, the others around are actually teach, were teaching me. And I think the thing, I mean, we, we started making bread together and we gave the bread away and, you know, from that unexpectedly really church appeared. Um, but I think that the, the, to say that somewhere else is a prophetic community is to say that the power is somewhere else. The power is not with those who set themselves up as leaders. It's with the community itself. And you've you've stood around that table, Kieran, and made oh, bread. And, indeed. you know, extraordinary, miraculous things happen uh, between the people that just happen to be, uh, you know, around the same table at the same time. You know this, it's open table. Mm. That just gathering around the table and being together causes extraordinary things to happen. And from that there is a message or a, um, a power, if you like, to be able to speak out, an authority, if you like, to be able to speak out to, to others that might think they're in power, but actually don't have those insights and don't have that wisdom. And that's what I mean by prophetic community. So it, uh, uh, rather than saying, oh, it's just some sort of ramshackle group of people that just happen to be together because they're all, you know, odd bods. It's actually saying together, um, we we have wisdom and, and insight and knowledge that that we can speak truth to power. Thank you very much indeed. It was um, it is it still remains an extraordinary community um, a further ten years plus on. Um, I would like to say I'm hugely proud of them. Um, so if anybody from if anyone from somewhere else is listening in, I would like to say I'm very proud of them. <laughs> so it was. Um, towards the end of your time in Liverpool that you and I spent the most time together and you and you and I and others started having conversations which led to your book called The Exuberant Church, Listening to the Prophetic People of God, which reflects on coming out as a spiritual experience and how the church too must come out. And as I've said in the intro, you described the coming out process as both profoundly human and deeply of God. So what do you think the church needs to learn from that experience? And 10 years on, maybe 
it's 10 years on 10 years this month since that book book, book was launched so uh maybe has your sense of that changed in that time uh, yeah um i mean lgbtqi community was very is very much part of the somewhere else community and 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 taught me a huge amount um, a massive amount and um and I, I think what made me really focus in order to write the book was the fact that I was leaving somewhere else. And I love that community and I'd spent 10 years with it. And, you know, it was in some ways really, really, really hard for me to leave. But I knew that if I wanted it to live, I had to leave it. And it's one of those, um, you know, ironies, I guess. Um, people that start stuff can stay too long, you know, and kill the thing they love the most. Um, so I knew I had to leave and and uh, I needed a fresh, you know, scene and challenge. And so I began, we had conversations, didn't we, Kieran, about coming out and what that means. And that sense of, um, uh, you know, the questions we ask ourselves, who am I? Uh, who do people think that I am? Who am I presenting as? Is this really me? Um, how, and, and sometimes that sort of disintegration of self that comes from thinking, I, I, people think I'm this, but you know, I'm not really that, I'm something else entirely. Um, and we liken that to um, a, a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. You know, a caterpillar just isn't just, a butterfly isn't just a caterpillar that's grown some wings and decided to fly a caterpillar has to kind of reduce itself to its DNA and, and to a juice really just completely disintegrate in order to be able to fly and to become something beautiful. I could sense that process in myself, although I wouldn't have named it as coming out, but when you were talking with me and others were talking with me about that, I could see there was a pattern of, of, you know, um, of discovery and finding an identity uh, that I could resonate with and and that was actually a source of huge hope for me um, because I could see that that this thing was a process rather than just you know a, a tragedy or a, a you know breakdown or whatever um, and I I think that that sense of coming out you taught you and your community taught me that and I could see that pattern in, our, in other places. I could see it for survivors. I could see it for people with addictions. I could see it for people in mental, with mental health crises. Um, and I, I think I kind of wrote the book out of that experience. I think now I can see it for the church in, in a way. I can see that, especially through COVID, you know, and, and the lockdown that we see a kind of disintegration of what we think church is, or, you know, we're, we're not what people say we are. We're not who we think we are. Uh, so the question is, who, who are we and what are we becoming? And that is both totally terrifying and, and, and actually really exciting if we can hold through that process of becoming, you know, the butterfly <laughs> that can fly. And I think, you know, it, communities like Open Table and somewhere else and many others are, are, are speaking back to the church in, in ways that are, it's more than just, oh, we need to include people that are different from ourselves. It, it's actually, we need to be transformed by this difference and we need to become something else. Absolutely. And um, yeah, we've, uh, we've also begun conversation about, you know, since it's 10 years since that book was written we've we've begun conversation about the possibility of maybe writing an, a sequel or an update um in these transformed times because um it felt ahead of its time um when it was published 10 years ago um so it is interesting to to consider how things have changed and how things might change if those lessons continue to be learned um so uh, so from Liverpool, you moved to Bradford, which is another city centre project in a Muslim Pakistani heritage area. So what did you learn from your experience of working with people of different faiths and cultures? Um, well, I learned I love curry. <laughs> the food is amazing. I'm really seriously missing Bradford curry. Um, I, I mean, Bradford is a, an ama amazing place in that it's, it's um, 
obviously the Pakistani community were invited over um, in the 1960s to work in the mills. Um, so it's not a multicultural city, it's predominantly um, Pakistani heritage, predominantly from Mirapur. Um, and, and so it's, it's quite unique in that way. And also Bradford, you know, it, it's had its issues and its troubles and it's had civil unrest and um, it has quite a negative Im it, um, uh, image in the press. The press love to paint Bradford, you know, as den of vice and iniquity. And of course it isn't, it's, it's, a, it's a real place. Um, it has its challenges and it has its delights. And um, I've worked at a project called Touchstone, which has been there for, for many years now. So I didn't form that project, um, but it's held its, held its place in the city centre. Uh, the church going to close, the church building had closed, but the Methodists decided to stay, good on them. And um, I think some of the stuff that I learned in Liverpool about making a safer space uh, making listening space conversation. I think that's that 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 I took with me. <laughs> I very deliberately didn't make bread, <laughs> although actually they do make bread now, even though it wasn't my idea. Um, uh, but um, the, I, I learned in Liverpool that if you can hold a safer space and give people attention and listen well then actually that's it's that that makes a difference and that's a transferable skill it went to Bradford with me and um and I met I've met some fabulous people working in interreligious dialogue and um particularly women you know that are finding creative ways to be together in, in you know many of the Muslim women say uh, people um you know uh, are discriminatory towards me on the bus. They want to take off my hijab. They, you know, they um, call abuse at me in the street. Everybody thinks my faith is a negative thing, and yet, you know, at Touchstone, you could talk about your faith being a positive thing and something that sustains you. And we talk about faith all the time. I think that's the gift of interfaith. You can talk about faith all the time. <laughs> Whereas in church, you don't do that, do you? Not so much, <laughs> and instead of making bread together, you wove together, didn't you? So uh, yeah. another kind of organic process. Exactly so. Yeah. Exactly yeah. so. Yeah. Yeah, I know that there are some folk who'd be particularly interested in your most recent experience as president of Methodist Conference uh, in extraordinary circumstances. But, um, I mean, you gave a beautiful speech in which you referenced somewhere else, an open table at, at the conference in 2019 as you took up the role. Um, and at that conference, then the Methodist Church approved a report called God in Love Unites Us. Um, so I know there are Methodist friends and colleagues here with us, but there are others who may not know the, the, the background to that. And so that report proposed to allow churches to hold same-sex weddings, but then COVID restrictions delayed churches debating and voting on the report and you were unable to see the final vote before you stepped down from that 12 month appointment in July 2020. So what was your experience of that process and what do you hope the outcome will be as we're inching closer towards that conclusion that you didn't get to see while you're in post? Yeah, I mean, the Methodist Church has been on this journey for a long, long time, as you will be aware. Um, and um, yeah, as have all denominations, to be honest, in various speeds and various directions. And um, we, you know, years ago, we, we made a resolution sort of conference, which were actually contradictory, but we've, we've lived with that contradiction for quite a long time. Um, and the, the report, um, God and Love Unites Us, is, is, um, is, a, is a very encouraging and positive report. I think we, we can be proud of ourselves as a denomination for, for producing something which has listened to a variety of voices and put people that actually profoundly disagree with each other onto a committee in order to, to write the report. Mm -hmm. And those people have worked very hard over, a, you know, a long time to, to, to reach this, you know, this paper. The nature of the debate at conference um, was, was good. Um, and I think behind the, the, the um, issues that we're talking about is the desire to live with contradictory convictions. Mm -hmm. 
um, personally, I think living with contradictory convictions is a, you know, it's a really grown up thing for the church <laughs> because it's very uncomfortable and we need to live as adults that actually profoundly disagree with each other. Mm. Um, and, and that's really, really tough. Um, so it came to the conference. I was president at the time. The nature of the debate, I felt, was, was measured and gracious, actually. Um, and people sp spoke with passion and um, th and I think um, we heard a range of views um, uh, and the vote that went through was was positive in terms of um, moving towards um, inclusion and, and uh, same-sex marriage and so on. Of course, it, it, the conference, which is our governing body, doesn't always reflect what's going on in local churches. Local churches, you know, are all different, like lots of different, different children, aren't they? And the different districts of Methodism have, you know, different histories and heritage. And so um, the conversation has been gone back to the districts for people to discuss. And um, and the syn the um, uh, the synods have, have been taking a vote, which will give a direction of travel. Um, however, it will now depend on the representatives of the conference to actually take the vote. <laughs> so we can we obviously will listen to the, everybody that is a representative of the conference will have listened to their synods and to their people, but in the end they will they will vote. So we're hopeful that the conference will meet in person um, at the end of June, beginning of July. I mean, that's <laughs> jury's been out on that because of the COVID restrictions, but it looks like we're going to meet in person. It feels really important that we meet in person. And the indications are that um, uh, that the vote will, will uh, enable this to happen. Um, there will be um, conscience clauses for clergy that feel that that's not something that they can engage in. Uh, however, they will have to refer same-sex couples that come for marriage to somebody else that might, you know, that will consider that. Um, it's it's not ideal. It's it's not um, it's not how some people feel justice is done. But but I I sense that we're making a big step, and I sense that that the vote will go through. You can never determine what will happen <laughs> at at a church conference, but it looks like it. Yes, and just for context, for those who may not have been following it, um, you know, our friends from Dignity and Worth, the Methodist uh, campaigning group, have been following the Synod votes, and I think, I believe all but one um, uh, local uh, vote has been in favour of accepting the report. Um, so it will be interesting to follow the progress at conference. I mean, it, it will be, and there are no win winners and losers in this, in a sense. Um, because there will be clergy that will be very hurt and will will leave the church. Um, I, you know, we need to acknowledge that, but we also need to acknowledge that there's so many LGBTQI people that have been hurt and 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 left the church, you know, because it's been untenable because of what's happened in the past, uh, and we mustn't forget that. Um, yeah. And so, so I'm going to move to some questions we've had from our. Uh, um, friends gathered with us tonight. Um, the first one um, echoes um, our earlier conversation about vocation and ministry. Um, so why do you feel God calls so many LGBT plus people to ministry roles, especially when this can entail so many challenges? <laughs> I think you should answer that question, really. <laughs> <laughs> um, why does God call I mean, God, God calls us because of who we are. And, and I guess um, people that have experienced vulnerability, people that have experienced, um, have had to go on the journey of discovering who they are. And, and people who have tr maintained their faith and their faithfulness despite discrimination and despite antagonism and all the rest of it. You know, that's in some ways tests the authenticity of a calling, doesn't it? I mean, I I know that um, I 
gave up fighting God on my vacation when I ran out of excuses. You know, and I, the, the last excuse I had was, well, I would become a minister if I wasn't a woman. You know, <laughs> and then I, I tricked myself up and said, well, that's just stupid, isn't it? Because I am. <laughs> that's the way I am. <laughs> so that's not an excuse anymore, is it? Um, and and I suppose I I've experienced with with the LGBTIQ community a sense of real tenderness and compassion and and um, and vulnerability, which which kind of enables God's voice to be heard as authentic anyway. Yes. But, you, but but I do think you guys should answer the question. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think I think it. I think well, one of the things that, that that you and I connected on was this sense of well, empathy, but also your insight into into our our journeys. Um, that, that, that you know, I I really really resonated with your description of um, uh, you know. If you can't go, you know, if you don't have a straight path, no pun intended, then you, 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 God finds a way around, um, and that's been my experience certainly. That I never foresaw, you know, you know, ten years ago, if you'd have said to me, you know, you'll be running a, a national charity of eighteen ecumenical worship communities, I would have thought you were insane, and um, and here we are. So you know, God has other ideas. Um, so yeah, it is an extraordinary question. I think uh, sometimes that's something where the church does need to look and listen and learn. But it's also about that coming out as a profoundly spiritual experience for those of us who have to question our identity. We can't just take it for granted because we don't fit into the convention or binaries that the church expects us to fit into. That is deeply profound and spiritual. And, and so therefore, I think it's probably not so surprising that um, out of all that questioning and transforming comes a sense of you know a, a stronger purpose in life perhaps mm. uh, so yeah um and so that but uh, this is what we found from these conversations is people really resonate with that sense of faith journey and vocation um so perhaps related to that one um so mark from dignity and worth was asking um where is it now how um how can LGBT plus people have confidence in the institutional church? So you might have Methodism in mind, but obviously that question resonates for all of us, I think. Well, it's a, it's a huge question, isn't it? Uh, and, and I would like to say you can, but, but I, I can't say that. Because I think that the church can still feel like a place of exclusion, still is a place of exclusion in, in some places. And... Um, and I can't do anything but apologise for that. Really, um, it it can be, it's it's not got a good track history of um, of inclusion in some places. Some places it's got you know, a wonderfully um, accommodating and and gracious and safe. And other places just aren't. I I don't know the answer to that. I mean, it's like in a sense asking me how. Do you know the sea is safe? Well, <laughs> you know, it isn't, is it? Um, but that doesn't mean to say you can't tip, put your toe in the water. Um, but <laughs> um, I, I'm hopeful that in as our awareness grows, as our intention to be inclusive grows, and as our meeting of people uh, from LGBTQI communities grows, then there will be a sense of... of um, of it of it being a safer place um a church isn't a safe place for lots and lots of people um uh, and i think one of the myths that the church tells itself is that it's a welcome and open you know and safe community and that's just for lots of reasons that's tricky for lots of people um i want it to be better and i think lots of people want it to be better and and the more people that want it to be better, the better it will become. But I can't promise it will be safe. No, no. Well, that's 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 really uh, authentic answer. That's um, it's our hope and prayer for for all our um, church communities, isn't it? Um, so Joan um, wanted us to express heartfelt gratitude to you for your wonderful stories in the book that you wrote with your vice 
um, president. Vice presidentess, yes. So the, the um, so you wrote a book with your vice president um, called "So What's the Story," um, and so Joan asked, could you share some uh, aids to help people with contrary convictions to really hear and accept our stories, and for us to accept that they won't or can't. Mm. Well, I, I've thought for a long time that the mission of the church is to listen. Mm. Uh, I think that often the church thinks its mission is to spout a lot of stuff. <laughs> you know, uh, We get our doctrine right, or we get our statements right, or we say the right things, or we preach the right sermon. I think the mission of the church is listening. It's a listening mission. And... Um, Listening isn't a soft thing. It's it's a challenging thing. It's hard, isn't it? To mm. really, really listen. Um, and to listen to people's stories that contain contradictions within them. I mean, you know, you've listened to a bit of my life's narrative and it, it, it it's it's not a linear thing. It <laughs> you know, it it's uh, it's can be a bit sort of muddled up and screwed up at places. So, so being able to listen and accept what people say and he really hear it and not listen in order to reply or have a better opinion or, you know, contradict is, is a skill. And I think actually we need training in it. I think, I think we need to teach people how, how to do that. Um, but stories are wonderful things. Um, and, uh, and we often don't hear them, do we, until we're at somebody's funeral <laughs> Then we hear the story of their life and we think, oh my, why didn't I listen to that before? Yeah. Um, so I think I think there's something about being assured enough, I think I've said this before, you know, assured enough in ourselves not to be threatened by somebody else, not to be threatened by somebody else's story. Um, and um and that's about that's about grace and and time and acceptance and all the stuff that Jesus tried to teach us and we're a bit, you know, in the slow learners class. Um, uh, but it's practice, I guess, isn't it? Yeah. And th there's an echo of that in the, the, another question. So, um, so um, the subject of the Church of England's living in love and faith process has come up in just about every one of these Q and A's. Uh, it's a parallel to the Methodists process. Um, so Peter um, is co-leads a Methodist Anglican project where we identify as one, he says. Um, in the light of the Anglican discussions of their living in love and faith report, how would you guide him to counter biblical opposition to marriage for same-sex attracted people? Well, <laughs> we can use the Bible as a weapon, can't we? And and I actually think that we, my my opinion is that the people that make the argument from the Bible are trying to make an argument from their heads, which is actually coming from their hearts. Mm -hmm. So we're using the, they're using the Bible to justify what they feel by saying that this is truth, <laughs> um, in in um, in a cerebral way. So I think you can't counter an argument that comes like that in any other way but from the heart. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that the people that make those, you know, we can lob biblical texts to each other, can't we, till the cows come home. And, you know, we can all come up with another biblical text which counterproves the last one. That's not how the Bible actually um, needs to be used. But, you know, people use it like that. But it's not going to get us anywhere doing it like that. What, what makes the counter argument is, is seeing somebody, loving somebody, knowing somebody that, that is actually a faithful, good, you know, Christian, faithful person who's living, you know, a, a different lifestyle and a, from a different orientation. And that's what makes the difference. And, and then, then the arguments have less sway. Um, but I, I wouldn't in any way say it's easy because the people that will argue from strict biblical texts have entrenched in that position with an understanding of, of truth as being something that, that is um, 
you know, on a tablet of stone rather than a discernment. It is indeed a hard place uh, it is. To, to have those conversations. I, th um, I think we have to be, I think we have to be continually gracious. And I know that's a massive thing to ask, you know, your communities who have been so gracious for so long and taken so much for so long. Um, but, uh, you know, but I think, but I think that's the only that's the only way. I, and I th as you are changing opinions by the very, you know, being who you are and and being the witnesses that you are and being the prophetic communities that you are, that's that's ch actually changing things. You may not feel it, but it is. And that's you know that's a long process and it it's um, it's tough. And and call being called to be continually gracious is. You know, it's tedious in one way, isn't it? Uh, but to, you know, to fight for justice, but to do it graciously, it's it's massive. So um, Jason um, is interested in the idea of churches coming out. So um, and uh, he asks, in what ways do you think the churches can come out? Oh, that's an interesting one. Um, I mean, if you think of the church from my childhood. Um, it was very, you know, it was very set in its ways. It was very orthodox in its ways, um, but it it's, was un, it's unsustainable. And I think that there is a meltdown that's happening in the churches. Um, you know, we cannot assume people are going to sign up to Christendom like they used to. Uh, we need to discover who we are through the meltdown and see how we become reconfigured. Part of that is happening, isn't it, with not being able to use buildings, not being able to sustain ministry, you know, all that stuff that's happened, been accelerated by COVID. Um, I hope we don't just go back to, oh, you know, where we were and trying to be who we were, but that we've discovered new ways of relating <laughs> that, that can transform us. And I think the mystery of transformation is we don't, we don't know um, what we're going to look like and we need to trust God in that process it, I think the church could be radically different it might be that it all happens on the internet it might be that it all happens in small groups it might be that we only have mega churches I you know I don't know the answer to that it might be that well who knows it might be <laughs> something we've ne not yet imagined <laughs> I think that's just the challenge and the opportunity is can the church be open to transformation or is it just about maintaining the status quo yeah, well, you're, you're witness to the fact that it can be open to transformation. I mean, your your Open Table Network is is witness to the fact that it can be open to transformation. It has been interesting. I've been rereading the exuberant church as in light of our recent conversations and preparing for tonight. And, um, you know, so to think that, you know, 10 years ago, there was a, a small community of maybe less than 20 people in Liverpool. And now you know, in person or online, we're reaching close to 5,000 people a month. So it's, it's, uh, it blows my mind regularly. I think it's proof that the spirit is moving and it's not, it's yeah. not our kingdom we're building. Um, no, and it kind of happens despite you, doesn't it? You know, I mean, you, I know you put in all the work and you make all the relationships and, you, you know, I'm not diminishing that. But actually what happens is, is nothing short of miraculous in the sense that it, it's despite you. It's kind of, oh, um, I know the somewhere else community, you know, uh, we were just, we just made bread. We simply made bread and gave it away. It was, it was not complicated. It was, you know, it was kind of really, really simple. But then um, we found there was a, a, there was a church in South Africa that was, you know, it was a, a developed because somebody had visited us from South Africa and went back to Soweto and made bread and gave it away. And yeah. I went out to visit them, you know, there they are with the bread rising in the sunshine of South African sunshine. Uh, you know, feeding the hungry kids of Soweto, going, oh, we have to listen to what the bread is telling us. And I, I'm thinking that's my line. That's what I tell I tell people <laughs> in Liverpool, you know, and that's, that's nothing short of miraculous. And 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 we have to trust the spirit in that. We, we, we're we not in control of how, how that happens. But, yeah. Um, so would you... You might feel we've covered this already, but there's a there's a couple of questions we've been asking all our patrons, um, which helps us to kind of build a multifaceted picture of of, of what we're about, really. Um, 
And, and so I want to ask this one because you, you know the theological definition of open table. Um, that means that the communion or Eucharist is open to everyone without condition. Um, and I believe it was a Methodist who invented the term in that sense. So, but I'm curious about what open table means to you, both in the, in the you know, in this wider sense, but maybe in terms of this particular network of communities. Um, well, just that. I mean, just, just that, really. Um, we're, this is an unconditional place of welcome because it's, it's where Jesus m meets us. So we, uh, you know, we are met in the, in the sacrament of bread and wine. We are met in the sacrament of each other's company, just, just as we are. And, and that there is no perfect person apart from Jesus. You know, we, we all come broken, flawed, confused, um, you know, <laughs> all of us, um, even those of us, you know, that try and look as though we know what we're doing. <laughs> we're, we're vulnerable humanity, aren't we? And, um, and, and as, as humanity were flawed because of the way we respond to creation and the way we, you know, are implicated in politics and all the rest of it, not just us as individuals, we, we come as we are, and that's your strap line. Um, we come as we are and that's good enough. Um, and more, more than enough, we come because we're, we're created, you know, out, out of God's love, whoever we are. And, and who, who can deny people that invitation? Um, that's what it means to me. And lots more, but that's what it means to me. Thank you. So I think we might just have time for one more question from, uh, from the community gathered tonight. So Richard, whom you've known for many years, as have I, Richard um, was uh, one of the first members of Open Table in Liverpool asks, how can we allow our sexuality to enrich our spiritual growth? And how can we enable our spiritual development to enrich our sexuality, our relationships? Oh, Richard, yeah, you know the answer to this question that you're posing. <laughs> it, um, yeah. Richard values hearing a, a wide range of responses, I think. <laughs> it's a question that we've, we've explored before. I, I mean, I think... Uh, through through the gift of being yourself and 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 who you are but i think you know thinking of richard i think about creativity and our our our, um, our innate power to be creative and um and to be imaginative um and uh and I think um, I, I've often thought, you know, I, I, I'm a my day job is a, a Methodist presbyter, but and I like to do a bit of oil painting, you know, and a bit of weaving and a bit of bread making, in my spare time. But actually, um, I've come to realise that it's that creativity that is my calling, um, and that that there's a possibility of thinking differently, um, and. Um, and, and in ways that are um, nonconformist or queer or, you know, outside the box, however you want to say that, just Im imagining the world differently. Um, uh, and uh, I don't think we can, I think we can't overthink it. Just be who, <laughs> be who you are and go for it. <laughs> be, who are, be who you are and go for it. <laughs> Thank you very much. So um, maybe just one or two more then um there's one question we've been asking um which kind of res echoes some of what we've already said but um really specifically you know think think of your experience in reconciling diverse communities you know uh, you've got an award for your reconciliation work so how can we sit together at an open table with people who would disagree with or exclude us Well, I, I think that's really difficult because I think there's no point putting yourselves in a situation where you're unduly vulnerable and people can't hear you. Uh, because I think that's, that's, um, 
that that's not going to get anybody anywhere uh, and that's that's so it's really tricky isn't it um i i i think if you're talking about uh you know in terms of structures that those conversations need to be facilitated they need to be held safely for you and you know so that so that conversation can happen really well um i think I think um, you've taken enough from people that can't hear you <laughs> to put yourself into situations where you're unduly vulnerable. Um, however, there, there will be people that, that are on the, on the brink of being able to listen and hear, and it's about discerning where that might be possible. Um, and and I, I can't give you a simple answer how that how that can happen. And you do need advocates as well, I think. You need people that can can hold the, the space safely um, in order to, to let the conversation happen. Um, but there are times when you just need to be together and you need to be safe in order to be able to take that vulnerability. And um, I, I wouldn't like to say there's any easy path through that, actually. If you could choose to sit around a table with anyone, who would it be and why? In my presidential year, I went to the Rohingya refugee camps in, uh, in Bangladesh. And I sat with some extraordinary women there who, I mean, um, they, they'd taken their babies out of burning villages and they'd walked up the river with the babies above their heads, you know, to keep them safe and they'd uh, fled for their lives uh, to to Bangladesh, and um, I I would really like to sit with them, mm. um, and and I would I, the problem with sitting with them is we don't speak the same language, so you know every conversation you have is through an interpreter. But I think I think uh, I I don't want to sit with the great people that think they're the great and the good and have got you know. <laughs> um, I want to sit with ordinary people that have got the the wisdom and the insight and the lived experience to um, to explain what life's like. I, I'd like to sit with those women. I would like to sit with those women as an equal rather than as a white, you know, Westerner that's coming to look at this this situation. I'd like to sit with them and share food and and really know what it is like to be there. And I, I thought of them often this year in through the COVID crisis, because, you know, it's been a big crisis in the West, but we've got a vaccine, you know, and um, we're probably going to be the other side of it. For those, for those women, they had a fire, didn't they, in the Rohingya camps a few weeks ago now, 60,000 of them were displaced because of the fire. And now, you know, these are women that have, already lost their homes to fire and they've now looked losing their refugee camp to fire we you know we don't know we're born really and um i i would like to sit with them and and i would like to really understand how they sustain who they are there you are thank you so much uh, barbara and uh, we look forward to sitting around a table with you uh um, perhaps at an open table event before yes, long um so friends, it's almost time to, to leave you. And this is the last of our Q&As with our patrons for now. But next month, we're doing something slightly different. June is Pride Month, which marks the anniversary of the Stonewall Riots in New York in June um, 1969. And that raised the profile of the LGBT plus rights movement worldwide. So following this Q&A format, we're going to speak to Nathaniel Hall, who is a theatre maker, actor, writer and HIV activist from Manchester. And in 2019, uh, um, his autobiographical show about his life living with HIV since the age of 16 um, was uh, award winning at the Edinburgh Festival. And in 2021, some of you may have seen Nathaniel as Donald Bassett in It's a Sin, Channel 4's hit drama written by Russell T Davis about the impact of HIV and AIDS um, in 1980s Britain. 
So he's now campaigning for a future where other people living with HIV can live openly, boldly and with pride. And Nathaniel will be speaking with Stephen Hilton, who is a curate at Manchester Cathedral and a supporter of Open Table in Manchester. And Steve's um, um, master's in theology thesis was on the lived experience of gay men living with HIV. Um, so thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, and we look forward to being with you in person or online again soon. Thank you very much indeed. Good night, everyone, and God bless.